Oh, the Mage Tower came into this world really quite dramatically amid quite a lot of complaints and not just the whole break glass in case of sub losses thing. No rewards. I mean, loads of people wanted to get the old weapon appearances. People maybe wanted the actual Druid Werebear. It hit the PTR and even then it was kind of a bit rough initially, but with a month or so until it would actually be live, the time to tune was there. But, and Walker, Christmas. Would two weeks of Mage Tower really be enough for the players? Especially when it's the most busy part of the year for many? The anger was there and credit to Blizzard. They listened, they responded, and now here we are. We have just finished a month of the Mage Tower, and it's time to talk about what happened and what this means for the game. By the way, Patreon 2022, a new set of loot, biggest revamp we've done. We've got an entirely new style for a bunch of things, including the pins. Uh, I think this pin for the Griffin is just, hmm. I love it. So that's what's going on. Patreon loot. It is down in the link below. Okay, let's talk. My Mage Tower experience. Well, I played a lot of Endwalker, right? After a lot of gaming, a lot of stress, wrapping up, you know, work in the office, the stress of preparing Christmas with the family, all of that. To be honest, I was like, all right, video games. Hmm. So I watched Witcher season two. I watched Star Trek Deep Space Nine, spent time with my parents. That's what Christmas is like for many of us. So by the time I actually got to the Mage Tower, it was Monday, January 3rd, two days before it went offline, and I hadn't done a lick of research. So I really do wish it was there a bit longer. I do not regret not playing it though, right? And I will say though, if the Mage Tower was to continue, I would be consistently playing it. I'd be dabbling, you know? As it stands though, there is no Mage Tower and I have zero reason to play World of Warcraft until patch 9.2, so I will not. Is that what Blizzard wants? You see, FOMO did not make me rush into playing it because I've learned to really try to value my overall life and to make myself less vulnerable to things such as marketing, algorithms, the attention economy. So, FOMO didn't get me in, and now their FOMO strategy just ensures that I don't have a reason to log into the game. That's a big pity. If it was there, I would log in, and you know what? That's a pretty good sign. So I'm going to talk about gameplay now. MM Hunter versus the Twins. It's a fight that was solid enough. I had some, had some good fun. It was clenchy. It was satisfying. <laughs> How did I do it then? Well, one part of it's obviously gear. Now, I did not go half mad into chromey time trying to hyper-optimize. That just doesn't do it for me. What I did though, was I purchased some dreadful gladiators gear, albeit incorrectly, because I just bought it all at item level 54, meaning that I couldn't use the Missa Pandaria shoulder inscription and a bunch of the legacy enchants. Whoops. <laughs> but between gear that scales differently, a set of gems, some tasty, tasty Boralus blood sausages, and the right flask, a major difference was made. And this is where the scaling system in the game is both, it's just mental, it's busted. The flask that I used gave me 31 agility. A Shadowlands flask, that'd only give me 20. And when you are scaled to level 50, that amount of agility actually makes a difference. Now, I did all that, and guess what? It was a really fun fight. It's one that did expose some inherent MMORPG weaknesses, though, and a bit of an over-reliance on macros. Because once you have a target last target macro set up for Karam, the fight just feels so much more comfortable. And to me, that is hardly a surprise, because generally speaking, think about using any software. The more clicks needed to complete a task that you want to complete, the worse the experience. You know what always does our head in whenever some graphic designer tries to make a site really minimal and pretty and all they end up doing is making it so that we need to do 55 clicks through a whole bunch of contextual menus to get the thing that we want. I think in MMOs when you're doing a bunch of playing the UI and there's targeting stuff, it can sometimes do that a bit. So that, hmm, put a little brainworm in me. Quibbles aside though, this is just what I wanted. To do pulls again and again, seeing that I get further every time, refining how I play having raced a few percent lower after each phase one intermission thingy. The skill and experience base progression is great, and I think this is what World of Warcraft needs a lot more of. Loved it. Brilliant. Agatha 
Well, for Agatha, I got my Fury Warrior decked out and all of the gear. I went in blind and I love just figuring it out. Admittedly though, Agatha is decently simple. Did I kill her? No, I didn't, because the servers went down and uh, I had to go to bed so I'd be up for work in the morning. I couldn't do it till the 5 a.m. you know, reset. So no more Mage Tower. I think I made it to like 48, 47% in, in Agatha and I, I think a few more attempts and it would be fine. But you know what? I had a blast, truly. It actually made me realize that for some kind of brain off, button mashing, smashy, smashy fun, I quite like the Fury Warrior. And that made me realize a hidden strength of this feature and of things like big class quests is that it gets people to try new things. Because I didn't really intend on in playing Fury, but I looked at the warrior and I thought their set was pretty cool. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll give this a shot. And what happens? I discover I am led to some gameplay that I enjoy that would maybe make me consider rolling Fury in the future or having one as an alt. So surely that's very healthy for the game. So look, the fights, they're not perfect, but generally speaking, I really do think they're fun. But it's modern World of Warcraft, and that does mean that it's all held together with tape and string. Tweaking a character, that's fun. That is RPG. Dealing with completely not intuitive things that are wholly a result of Blizzard's scaling system being, from a player facing perspective, a load of pants, that's not good. Because if you don't have the WoW head guide or you're not tuning into the YouTuber with the big in-depth guide, you're at quite an informational disadvantage and none of this is explained intuitively in the game. Surely an Agi flask should be an Agi flask. Scale one down to 50, scale one up to 50, and they should give you the same amount of agility. Why not? Why don't they? It's a mess. Now, there's a good side here. Making millions of gold from dreadful gladiator gear and expensive gems? You guys had fun. Hyper-optimizing to kind of break something in a game? Come on, that's fun. But what if the scaling just worked? Or what if Blizzard tried to design some gameplay around this power optimization part of the Mage Tower? We'll return to that idea. I mean, part of me says, just give us stat templates and call it a day, let the challenge be a challenge. I don't know. The oddness surrounded what was, though, a very fun experience for both Matt and I. And I think it is something that exposes what is and isn't fun. Some forms of challenge are a lot of fun, others are a bit less fun. I do think that being screwed over by a rough overlap or just being overwhelmed by UI challenges in a way that a weak aura, big wigs, or macros fixes, I think that's kind of odd. I mean, Matt found that uh, Sigrin was way easier with, uh, you know, like DBM and stuff. And for me, I mean, come on, use that target last target macro for Karam and your concussive shot, and the twins ends up being a vastly more enjoyable fight. Technically, it is easier, but why is it easier? Well, it's easier because there's fewer clicks to perform the action I want to perform, and that means that I feel closer to the game. Sure, it's not like having a neural interface for WoW, but I do feel closer to my character's action. For Matt, his Vengeance Demon Hunter run was quite interesting. Krull is fundamentally awesome, but there were odd things like Spirit Bomb ended up doing like loads of damage, kind of more than the tooltip suggested. And then the Seed Pod Trinket from Nathendra it basically won the fight for him. It was so powerful. And so many trinkets are just insane in their scaling. And not to mention the likes of Crusader, which just regularly granted my warrior full heals during Agatha. Xylem. I haven't done him, but Matt loved the fight. Once more, Crusader came in and helped him so much. And just the difference between going in raw using Shadowlands gear versus spending maybe 80,000 gold, 100,000 gold to optimize a bit, it was night and day. So let's kind of dive into this. The gameplay the Mage Tower created outside of the actual fights seems entirely accidental and chaotic. It's a bit of what Matt would call kusoge. Now, that's basically a Japanese word for shitty game. But it doesn't really mean that. It refers to kind of when something's a bit shitty, a bit broken, but also fun. It's an oddly endearing word uh, used in the fighting games community. Now, the natural interactions with crafted gear created economic gameplay. That's fun, that's awesome. Sometimes, you know, going in with Shadowlands gear, to me, I could notice it would feel maybe a bit less fun, 
but going in decently optimized, but not chromy time hyper optimized. I mean, I was doing this not with hyper optimal trinkets or anything. I was using Shadowlands trinkets. I thought that was generally quite fun. And it's this thing where who knows what Blizzard's difficulty target is for any of this stuff. For me, I found them to be more fun when I had sort of better gear and a few macros because that kind of left a bunch of tuning things and just control jank. And what it left was the core mechanical difficulty of the fights, which you absolutely, you know, you had to know. And that's what was really fun. And that's what I loved about these fights. So it's an interesting tuning question. I mean, fixed stat profiles would allow them to do a heroic and a mythic version of these fights. Maybe that would be an idea. For many though, some of the gameplay game came down to just really wanting a trinket, really wanting the seed paw, or the seed pod, wanting the eye of seeth, right? One of those trinkets that's just utterly transformational. Now, I, ever, I never used a transformational trinket, but a lot of people will have wanted that thing, but found they were really limited by the weekly lockouts. Of course, for those of us in FF14 land, we kind of chuckle because in FF14, the old raids have no lockout. Do you want something? Well, have at it. Farm away. Do whatever you want. I'd kind of like something like that in World of Warcraft to make those farms a bit more engaging, like a thing you can go and do for an hour rather than one, you know, four or five minute activity in a checklist. I mean, the Ravage Seed Pod got the kill for Matt. What if it didn't drop? So it's an interesting situation, and as we said, we think that this is legitimate gameplay, but we do think it was created rather accidentally, all because of the scaling being wonky as applied to the Mage Tower. But a fundamental truth is that customizing your pots, your trinkets, and your talents to match a fight is fun. I mean, do you want to go for a Giga Hyper Burst pot, or do you want to go with one of those Legion pots that just gives you stats for a minute? What's the damage profile you want for the fight? So I think this stuff is fundamentally cool, but I think things are a little bit less cool when it's clearly busted. I mean, even hello, post nerf crusader that was still uber strong. Why are old enchants that strong? Why aren't enchant damage values normalized somehow? Isn't it just damage per proc and RPPM or an expected stat value? Why can this not be batch changed to match some sort of intended output? Why does the scaling break for them? Why does the scaling break so much for everything in general? Why does each stat squish end up messing up legacy content for a bit? Why was Battle for Azeroth gear so strong, or stuff so strong? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, something I've noticed lately is a lot of people, like, they look at American Congress people or senators or whatever, they look at their stock trading activity. So it's like, what if this whole thing was orchestrated by some Boralis uh, blood sausage peddler on the systems design team? <laughs> who's made a killing. Okay, no. Nah. Jokes aside though, this side of the scaling should be fixed up. I would rather play the game than play Broken Maths, um, where, you know, the gains that come from reading www.iwantthemagetowertobeeasier.com, uh, you know, where that's where you make your gains, rather than playing often. I think it trains people a bit weird. So, you know what? I think we've actually learned a hell of a lot from this, Jank. And I think the future could be absolutely brilliant and exciting. Quirks aside, I think this is a brilliant feature for the game and I am thrilled that it's here. How could it be even better then? Or could it work as an always on game feature, not an event? I mean, come on. Imagine if each expansion added a set of bosses to the Mage Tower. In a few expansions time, this would be a vibrant, evergreen feature. It would always be something to be excited for. It would be amazing too, for new or returning players who just have all this content. How would you do it though? I mean, first up, pure stat templates, right? I mean, this could really normalize the difficulty. This could ensure that the content works with minimal maintenance needed from Blizz. And I think that is really what's important here because we want great content that doesn't overly burden the developers in maintenance and upkeep. Would it be dull though if there were stat templates? Well, if you did want some gearing, maybe there is a way that you could design a set that could be earned. Uh, maybe you could just fix up the scaling so the crazy outliers aren't there and, you know, maybe trinkets. Those are another very interesting design space. Could you make a set of mage tower trinkets that you could sort of earn somehow? Maybe they could actually open up some some fun new gameplay things, and they could even shore up some toolkit differences between specs because, well, 
Number one, each spec can't have a unique fight be tailored to it. There's seven fights for well, like 36 specs, so that would help. And also, some specs are pretty different now in Shadowlands to how they played back in Legion. They have different kits. Hell, class locked pots or consumables, you could start to do some things there. I mean, the Brawler's Guild has got some of its own consumables. Of course, it would suck if this ended up just homogenizing toolkits, so you can't take that sort of thing too far. And then the Brawler's Guild, as I mentioned, it's got its own unique set of consumables. So could something be made for a Mage Tower feature that's a bit more like that? Maybe you could tie that into Profession so you get the economic gameplay. And then think about the theming of the Brawler's Guild. It's really cool. Could we double down on the theme of the Mage Tower? Let's talk about that. You know the way the Argent Tournament feels like a place? It doesn't feel like a gameplay system to get mounts. It feels like, oh, it's the Argent Tournament. It's the big tournament. It happens over there. It's quite natural in the game world. Well, how about we have the mages band together and establish a new mage tower away from the broken shore? Narratively speaking, this could be us tackling, who knows, a, an interdimensional most wanted list. Or it could be us summoning in big scary enemies to train. Or you could rebrand this gameplay feature entirely around everyone's favorite character now because she gives us all the great features, Chromie and the Bronze Dragons, and make it full of lore-rich solo challenges. Heck, why not add in some optional narrative quests? And if you wanted some more accessibility to this content, why not have a heroic mode that is a bit like a hyper-optimized player going into the Mage Tower and then a, you know, in terms of difficulty, right? And then a mythic mode that is like just legit big rock hard and then have some different rewards for them. You could turn it into, like, not just a little event, but a thing. A feature that World of Warcraft has, rather than a transient event. As you can see, then, this would be an incredible feature. It would be an evergreen feature for World of Warcraft. I really hope the developers see that with this Mage Tower, originally, they were so onto something awesome. I hope they see the renewed interest in this form of gameplay. And personally, if I'm thinking about what would make me really excited in the next expansion, if they said, hey, okay, you guys like this, we're really going to put a lot of resources into it and we're going to make a big, cool new thing, I would be over the moon. It would sure let people know that the, you know, the Blizz understands what sort of content people want. I think it's really nice, too, to have a challenging solo gameplay option that you can hop in and out of without a time and social commitment. I mean, it's nice having two raid nights a week, but what if you want to log in and spend some time in Azeroth not in a raid group? World of Warcraft does need solo content, and I think it needs the world content to be better, but also features like this. Also, it gets people playing way more specs, way more classes, and surely that would keep players just around for longer. I mean, hey, imagine if player housing existed, or there was a new version of class order halls, Imagine if they made a great hub area for pet battlers, a great hub area for PvPers, and then this for the big sweaty solo players. Each an evergreen feature that would serve the game long into the future, something that wouldn't have to be tied to the new zone or the new thing from the new expansion. Surely that's the sort of thing that would be more exciting to develop, even as a developer, than whatever the latest one patch throwaway system is. So. That's my post-mortem on the Mage Tower. Certainly a few funky bits to it, but overall, I'm very glad it was there. I will be playing it next time it comes around, and I think that all this interest means we should investigate things like this further and do them in the future. I hope you found it interesting. Let me know, though, what was your Mage Tower experience? And between Endwalker and the Christmas break and spending time with family, what was the timing of the Mage Tower feature like for you? I know I would have liked to have played more of it, but... I mean, at the end of the day, I want to spend time with my family over Christmas, and I'm not really going to sacrifice that for Blizzard's FOMO event, and it kind of feels weird that they sort of would ask you to. Yeah, okay, that's basically that. Of course, if you want to support us and get some awesome things like this really, really cool Griffin pin that's uh, available this month, then you can check out the Patreon down below. Have a wonderful day. See you next time.